In the previous episode 4 of Skanderbeg, we covered how the Arbor army managed to demolish the Ottomans at the Battle of Albulena in 1457. Ever since the Arbor League of Leja was created in 1444, the great Hungarian leader, Janusz Hunyadi, had become close friends with Skanderbeg and was a crucial supporter for Skanderbeg's efforts to withstand Ottoman expansion in the Balkans. However, fate dealt a cruel blow when Janusz Hunyadi felt ill during the siege of Belgrade and passed away just a few weeks later on August 11th, 1456, leaving Skanderbeg in a vulnerable position. In the aftermath of Hunyadi's death, quarrels over the Hungarian throne erupted and chaos ensued. It was not until January 21st, 1458, when Hunyadi's son, Matthew Corvinius, was finally crowned king of Hungary and Croatia. Although Hunyadi and Skanderbeg shared similar intentions, the new Hungarian monarch did not share the same aspirations as his late father did. Rather than joining forces with Skanderbeg, Corvinius focused on protecting his kingdom from any Ottoman invasion. In addition to losing his alliance with Hunyadi, Skanderbeg's troubles continued to mount when he lost his close ally, King Alfonso of Naples, on 27th of June, 1458. The sudden demise of Alfonso left his son Don Ferente in a precautious situation. When Ferente made a bid for the throne of Naples, he quickly encountered fierce oppositions from Pope Calixtus III. On July the 12th, 1458, the Pope openly declared that the throne of Naples was vacant, accusing Ferente as an illegitimate son. In a shocking move, the Pope sought to install his nephew Pedro Luis de Borja as the next ruler of Naples. However, after Pope Calixtus' death on August 6, 1458, Pope Pius II eventually crowned Ferente as the King of Naples on September 1459. While Pope Pius II had been using European leaders to launch a crusade on the Ottoman Empire, months before Ferdinand's coronation, the Pope had declared that he would not give Skanderbeg as much financial support as his predecessors had previously done. As a result, Skanderbeg refused to attend the Council of Mantua on May 1459, which was going to be held to plan the future crusade. Simultaneously, as Sultan Mehmet II had managed to capture Belgrade in 1459, the Sultan was informed of Pope Pius' crusade against his empire. Aware of Skanderbeg's strained relations with the Pope, the Sultan dispatched diplomatic envoys to negotiate a truce with Skanderbeg in an effort to keep him from joining the crusade. Even though the Pope considered Skanderbeg's assistance essential for his plans, he ordered Skanderbeg not to accept the Sultan's peace proposal. Soon after Ferente became King of Naples, John II of Anjou laid claim to the throne of Naples, openly threatened both the Pope and King Ferente with war. As of 1460, John II began to rebel against King Ferrante's crown. Lacking the necessary military forces to secure his position, King Ferrante turned to the Pope for help. Due to internal conflict between Italian kings, the Pope then turned to Skanderbeg and advised him to support Alphonse's son. In his response, Skanderbeg sent ambassadors to the Pope who assured him that if Skanderbeg helped Ferrante, the Pope would have to approve the Sultan's peace proposal, which Rome eventually accepted. 
Even though Skenderbeg signed a three-year peace treaty with the Sultan, he was suspicious that if he would leave and help King Ferente, the Sultan might attack Kruja in his absence. As a precaution, Skenderbeg sent his ambassador and nephew, Jok Stres Balsha, with a company of 500 cavalrymen to aid Ferrante's forces. When Baron Giovanni Orsini of Toronto, one of King Ferrante's fiercest rivals, heard of Skanderbeg's preparations, he wrote a demeaning letter to discourage Skanderbeg from his venture. Enraged by Orsini's insult, Skanderbeg penned a reply on October 10th, 1460, saying, Moreover, you scorn our people, claiming the Albanians as nothing more than sheep, and according to your customs, think of us with only insults. It would seem you know nothing of the origin of our race. Our elders were the Epirots, from whence Pyrrhus himself came forth, the might of whom the Romans could barely withstand. Those very Epirots, whom with their weapons set forth and conquered Taranto and much of Italy. There exists no challenge to their might from the likes of the Tarantinas, a species of wet men born only to catch fish. And since you proclaim Albania as part of Macedonia, then you grant also our elders as nobles who went as far as India under Alexander the Great, defeating all the people that came before them with great ease. From those men descended these who you call sheep. But if the nature of things has not changed, why do your men then run away in the faces of sheep? As John II progressed against King Ferrante's crown during the spring of 1461, he managed to capture the castle of Trani, forcing the Arbor Naple army to retreat and seek refuge at the castle of Barleta. Fearing that if Barleta would fall, it would surely mean the end of his reign. Urgently, King Ferrante sends letter to the Pope begging him for more help. Wanting to put an end to the internal conflict in Italy, Pope Pius assured Skanderbeg financial aid if he personally helped King Ferrante. When King Ferrante became aware of Skanderbeg's arrival, he ordered Jok Stresh Balsha to take four galleys and set sail for the Arbor Shores. As soon as Jok Balsha arrived in late August 1461, he hastily gathered supplies and with the main army he returned to aid King Ferrante at Puglia. Before leaving for Puglia and joining his men, Skenderbeg had left his wife Donica in charge of his affairs and set sail for Ragusa. When Skenderbeg and Pal Angel, the Archbishop of Duras, arrived in Ragusa on 24th of August 1461, he was greeted with a lavish ceremony praising him as their savior against the Ottomans. Soon after Skanderbeg collected the gold Pope Pius had previously promised him, they set sail for Puglia, finally reaching Barleta on 3rd of September, 1461. During Skanderbeg's five months swift assault in Italy, he immobilized the Angevins and other Italian lords at the campaign of Barleta, the Battle of Andria, the Battle of Seggiano. However, shortly after capturing the castle of Trani, Skanderbeg was informed that Sultan Mehmed was preparing a large campaign against Kruja. Before returning home, Skanderbeg left some of his soldiers to help secure King Ferente's throne and then returned home with the rest of the army. When Skanderbeg finally reached the Arbor Shores, he was relieved that Mehmed's preparation to take Kruja were untrue. To his surprise, 
Mehmed, who had honored the three-year ceasefire, was instead preparing to attack Bosnia. After King Ferrante's crown was secure, Pope Pius II approached the Venetian Republic to resolve their problems with Skanderbeg and convinced them to join his ambitious anti-Ottoman crusade. While some Venetian senators, who maintained close relations with the Sultan, did not side with the Pope, others were convinced that sooner or later they would have to fight against the Ottomans to preserve their possessions along the Aegean Sea. As a sign of good faith, the Arbor army was allowed safe passage through Venetian territories of Škoder to help Bosnian King Stefan Kotsacha. However, on the following month of May in 1463, after the truce between Skenderbeg and the Sultan had ended, Mehmet II would once again put Skenderbeg in a difficult position. With a mighty display of force, Sultan Mehmet led his army to Skopje with an intent to intimidate Skenderbeg into signing a new peace treaty. The message was clear, sign now or suffer the consequences. Proud and steadfast, Skenderbeg refused to bend to the Sultan's will. But as the pressure was mounting, he was left with no choice but to sign the agreement without the Pope's approval. When the Pope became aware that the Sultan's peace treaty was more advantageous for him than for Skanderbeg, he sends Cardinal Basarion and the Council Vettore Capello to the Venetian Senate on July 29, 1463. The impassionate speech they gave to the Senate and the urgency to abandon relations with the Sultan and join the Ottoman Crusade was made very clear to the Grand Council. On the following month of August, the entire Republic of Venice accepted the terms and appointed Skenderbeg as commander of the coalition forces in Arberia. The importance of Skenderbeg's participation in the crusade was made clear by Pope Pius when he addressed the Christian world in St. Peter's Church on 21st of October, 1463, saying, The Albanians will also be with us. Despite the Pope's valiant effort, the Grand Venetian Council, once allied with Skanderbeg, soon abandoned him, leaving him to fend for himself in the treacherous political landscape. Despite this setback, Skanderbeg was not without allies. King Ferranto of Naples, who owned his throne to Skanderbeg, extended an invitation to the valiant warrior. Skanderbeg accepted the invitation and made his way to Naples. Upon his arrival, King Ferrante welcomed his entourage with open arms, expressing his gratitude for securing his throne. In a display of goodwill, King Ferrante offered Skanderbeg an annual payment of 1,200 ducats as a token of his appreciation. Legends has it that King Ferrante of Naples played a significant role in arranging a historical meeting between Skanderbeg and the Pope. While there is a lack of documented sources to corroborate this claim, there are, however, recorded accounts of Skanderbeg visiting Pope Pius II on July 1464. Accompanying Skanderbeg on this momentous occasion was Pal Angel, the Archbishop of Duras, and his cousin Dimitar Frango. According to Frango's journals, the group discussed a grand plan where he would entitle Pal Angel as Cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church and then coronate Gerge Castriot Skanderbeg as King of Epirus and all the provinces of Arberia. After their brief visit to Rome, Skanderbeg and Dimitar Frango returned to Cruja, while Pal Angel traveled to the Duke of Milan, Francesco Sforza. There, the Duke presented the infamous goat helmet as a symbol of Skanderbeg's struggle 
against the Ottoman Empire and an acknowledgement of his unwavering commitment. The inscriptions on the helmet says Jesus Nazarenus, Principi Emathie, Eregi Albanae, Terrori Osmanorum, Eregi Epirotarum, Benedicti Te. As Pope II set sail to coronate Skanderbeg as King of Albania, the Pope fell gravely ill during his journey. Unable to recover from his illness, Pope Pius II died on August the 14th, 1464, in Ancona. Among his predecessors, Pope Pius II was the only Pope who truly understood Skanderbeg's struggle and had pledged to lead a crusade against the Ottoman Empire with Skanderbeg at the helm. It is hard to imagine the profound effect it would have had if Skanderbeg had been crowned king by the Pope himself. Nevertheless, the loss of Pope Pius II would later prove to be a devastating blow for Skanderbeg. Meanwhile, at Sultan's court in Istanbul, as Murad was assembling his army to wage war against the crusade, he divided his forces in three parts. The first part marched to invade Hungary and Bosnia. The second part set out to invade Venetian-controlled areas of Morea. And the third part marched towards the eastern borders of Macedonia to invade the Arbor State. As the third wave of Ottoman troops drew closer to the Arbor borders, Skanderbeg received devastating news of Pope Pius' death. Fearing that the alliance with the Venetians might crumble in the wake of the Pope's death, Skanderbeg quickly mobilized his army and rode out to face Sheremet Bey's forces at the besieged city of Ohrid. Meanwhile, in Rome, the new Pope, Paul II, wasted no time in rekindling the Christian Crusade. With a resolved demand, he called upon the Venetians to fulfill the agreement with Skanderbeg by appointing him as one of the main commanders of the Crusade and ordered Antonio de Cosanza's troops to join Skanderbeg's army in Ohrid. As Sheremet's forces were closing in, the reunited Venetian Arbor forces marched towards the borders, leaving a path of destruction in their wake. When Sheremet's forces finally reached Ohrid in mid-July 1464, Skanderbeg ordered Pek Emanuele and Pieter Angel, the brother of Pal Angel, to provoke Sheremet into a fight. After they approached the gates of Ohrid, Emmanuel and Peck began to irritate the garrison by taunting them and throwing smoke bombs at them. Irritated, the Ottoman cavalry unit immediately began to chase them. When the Turks finally arrived at the chosen destination, they were quickly surrounded by the Arbor army. After the battle had ended, Thousands of Turkish soldiers had been killed, and a dozen officers had been captured. Skanderbeg, who wanted to use the momentum, ordered the entire army to besiege the castle of Ohrid. After several days of fighting, the Venetian commander Antonio de Cosenza abandoned the fight, forcing Skanderbeg to lift the siege and return to Kruja. In the case of Sheremet Bey's son and the captured officers were later ransomed back to the Sultan for 40,000 ducats, an estimated value of around 6 million euros. Despite their failure to capture Ohrid, the Venetian Senate hailed the campaign as a great triumph for the alliance. In the following year, 1465, Sultan Murat II brought about a significant change in his strategy against Skanderbeg. Cunningly, the Sultan launched a divisive plan 
to destruct Skanderbeg's army by inciting social revolution within the Arbor State. Balaban Pasha, a fellow Albanian and a loyalist to the Ottoman Empire, heard the Sultan's call and challenged Skanderbeg in a series of five consecutive battles. Although Skanderbeg had been victorious in all five battles, the first battle of Vaikali, however, came to a great cost to Skanderbeg. For during the battle, Balaban Pasha had managed to capture esteemed soldiers including Muiz Golemi, Muzaka of Angelina, Vlash Golitsa, Jin Muzaka, John Parleti, Nicole Erizon, Jerj Kuka and Jin Maneshi. Shortly after the fifth and final battle was won, the Arbor soldiers had been brutally massacred. After being beaten for weeks for not giving in to the Sultan's demand, they were skinned alive and then fed to the dogs. Following the horrendous massacre of 1466, the Sultan laid plans to capture Kruja for the second time. Before surrounding Kruja, the Sultan ordered his army to march in the direction of Shkumbim Valley and loot all inhabitant centers, burn down their villages and massacre every loyal Arbor soldiers along the way. As Turkish slave owners penetrated the countryside, they began to round up hundreds of innocent women and children and shipping them off to slave traders. Those that managed to escape took refuge high up in the mountains while others fled to Italy. When many of the arbors that fled and reached the Italian shores, rumors began to circulate that Skanderbeg had been defeated. Once the news reached Rome, infectious panic started to spread, believing that Ottomans would easily cross into Italy. What Rome was totally unaware of was that Skanderbeg and his army were still resisting and fighting bravely. During the Arbor heroic resistance along the Shkumbin Valley and the Black Dream Valley in 1466, it was well documented by the Byzantine chronicle Cristobal. While in service to Sultan Mehmet II, Cristobal took part in the campaign against the Arbors in 1466, giving a vivid description of the event, saying, As soon as spring came, the Sultan set out against the Illyrians. With great force, he attacked the narrow path, which were strongly guarded by the Illyrians. Upon the next day, there was a great battle, and though the Illyrians fought valiantly, he broke them and became lord of the narrow path by force, inflicting a great carnage on them. With the Arbor forces already weakened in the first phase, the Sultan saw an opportunity to personally lead the second phase of the battle. This time, he aimed to besiege the formidable fortress of Kruja, the same stronghold that his father Sultan Murad had been defeated in 1450. As the Sultan's army marched towards Kruja, Skanderbeg prepared his defense by stationing Tanush Thopia with 4,000 soldiers inside the castle walls, while the rest of the army of roughly 8,000 men was stationed well outside the castle. Once again, Skanderbeg utilized his legendary guerrilla tactics, causing immense damage to the Ottoman forces. For weeks, the Ottoman army launched attack after attack on the Albanian defense, but Skanderbeg's soldiers stood their ground with fierce determination. Their overwhelming resolve proved too much for the Sultan's forces, who were unable to break through. 
after two months of unsuccessful attacks, the great conqueror of Constantinople, Sultan Mehmet II, was humiliated under the walls of Kruya. Once again, Skanderbeg's leadership was too great to be defeated, cementing yet another victory against the mighty Ottoman Empire. Exhausted and disgraced, the Sultan was forced to leave Kruya in August 1466, but not before ordering Balaban Pasha and his 80,000 soldiers to continue the siege. In a strategic move to cut off trade routes leading to Kruya, Mehmed ordered to build a new fortress on the ruins of Valmi Castle in Elbasan. Months later, after Elbasan fortress was completed, the Sultan departed for Istanbul. On his way back, he laid waste to the city of Çdin in Dibra, ordering the merciless slaughter of thousands of innocent men, women and children as revenge for his humiliating defeat at Kruya. Though the Sultan's thirst for vengeance had unleashed untold horror upon the land, Skanderbeg and his people would not be broken. Desperate to restore honor to his people, Skanderbeg sent envoys to various powerful figures, including King Ferrante, Pope Paul II, Hungary, Venice and Ragusa, pleading for their support in the ongoing siege of Kruja. In a remarkable response, Pope Paul II invites Skanderbeg to Rome, promising him aid and support. Despite Kruja being under siege, Skanderbeg set sail for Rome. Upon his arrival on 12th of December 1466, he was received with great fanfare and reverence by the Pope and his cardinals. As Skanderbeg walked through the streets of Rome, a multitude of people cheered and honored him as the mighty defender of Christendom showering him with admiration, worthy only of a great hero. On Christmas Eve, Skanderbeg appeared at St. Peter's Cathedral, where the Pope awarded Skanderbeg with a sword and a coat of arms, hailing him as Alexander the Great of the Epirots. Despite the lavished welcome, Skanderbeg departed from Rome with no financial aid but only with magnificent weaponry. Before returning home, Skanderbeg made a brief visit to his friend King Ferente of Naples, who granted him 1,500 ducats and 300 carts of grain. When Skanderbeg finally reached the Arbor Coast in March 1467, he traveled to Liege to coordinate a joint struggle with the Arbor nobles. With the help of Lech Dugagini and some Venetian units from Skodra, they allied themselves with Skanderbeg's army to assault Balaban forces at Kruja. As the joint army moved towards Kruja, Skanderbeg received intel that Balaban Pasha's brother was on his way to help his brother. In a daring move, Skanderbeg redirected his army towards the enemy, catching them off guard and inflicting a devastating defeat. That same evening, the Arbor War Council gathered and plotted their next move. Under the cover of darkness, disguised Arbor soldiers entered the castle and informed Tanush Topia of the battle plan. On the following morning of April 23, 1467, cries of war echoed from within the castle walls. And as the gate opened, the Arbor army emerged in front of the castle, ready for battle. Confident in his numbers, Balaban ordered his entire army to charge them. 
but just before Balaban's army approached the gates of Kruya, Skanderbeg and his warriors charged them from the rear, cutting down the enemy from all sides. After a long and bloody struggle, Balaban was surrounded and ultimately killed, securing a hard-fought victory for Skanderbeg and his army. Meanwhile, as the Venetian-Ottoman war escalated along the Arbor coast, the Ottoman garrison from Elbasan and Vlora intensified its advance towards Duras and Shkotra. The Venetians urgently promised Skanderbeg troops if he would help them drive out Ottomans from Elbasan. Well aware that he would receive little help from the Venetians, Skanderbeg was unwilling to risk a great sacrifice alone in Elbasan. Instead, Skanderbeg traveled back to Leja to make a final attempt to reassemble the Arbor League of Leja. A few days before the meeting, the Ottoman army that was stationed in Dardania had surrounded and began to besiege the fortress of Rozafa in Shkodra. Skanderbeg, who had previously fallen seriously ill with malaria, was unable to participate in the battle at Rozafa, was forced to recuperate in Leja. Although the Arbor army fought without its supreme leader, they won a great victory over the Turks. Sadly, a few days later, the 63-year-old Djerj Kastriot Skanderbeg drew his last breath on 17th of January, 1468. After his death, Skanderbeg was buried at St. Nicholas Church in Leja. The sheer number of his military successes impressed the Ottomans so much that when Turkish soldiers found Skanderbeg's tomb in Leja, they ransacked his grave, took his bones and made amulets from them, believing that the bones would grant bravery to the owner. Ten years after Skanderbeg's death, the Venetians received permission from his widowed wife Donika Castriotti to defend Kruja and other fortresses. But when the final siege of Kruja began in 1477 and lasted until June 16, 1478, the entire city surrendered to Sultan Mehmed II himself. As Skanderbeg's lands were conquered by the Ottomans, Albanian leaders and their followers were forced to flee to the Kingdom of Naples, seeking refuge from the Ottoman oppression. These migrations led to the emergence of the Arberesh community, a legend that continues to thrive in present times. Despite numerous attempts to regain control by Djerj Kastriot II, Skanderbeg's grandson, in 1501, the Turks consolidated their control over Albania for more than four centuries until Albania finally declared its independence in 1912. During these episodes, we have shown that Skanderbeg was a successful military commander who inflicted outstanding victories against the Ottoman Empire for 24 years, earning him a reputation as one of the greatest commanders of his time. However, it is equally important to recognize that his remarkable knowledge of diplomacy contributed significantly to his military success. For without his political acumen, he most likely would never have managed to hold out as long as he did against one of the greatest empires of our time. The fact that Skanderbeg corresponded with five different popes in more than 400 letters during his reign, conducted a census among the Arbor people, collected taxes based on Roman and Byzantine laws, 
created a functioning state with ambassadors and clergies and much more attest to his high intellect as a great leader. It has truly been an honor making these videos and I have genuinely enjoyed every minute making them. If you enjoyed watching them, it would mean a great deal for the channel if you smash that like button, subscribe and all that jazz. I want to give a special thanks to the illustrator Ken Art for letting me use his amazing art for these episodes. Links to Ken Art's social media in the description. Last but not least, I want to give a big thanks to both old and new members that continually contribute to the channel. You guys are truly amazing. Thanks again. Until next time.